Stanford University. Well, now that's given us the landmarks for us to put in various branches of the external carotid artery. Just below the uh, greater cornea of the hyoid bone, we have the superior thyroid artery, uh, which gives off a small infrahyoid branch and a superior laryngeal branch. The superior laryngeal branch pierces the thyrohyoid membrane at that point. And then the superior thyroid artery comes down and it's about here that it divides into its terminal branches to go into the upper part of the lateral lobes of the thyroid gland. Just opposite the tip of the greater cornea of the hyoid bone, we have the lingual artery. Now, in view of the fact that we have to protrude the tongue, we must have some slack in this artery, so we find it loops up in this fashion and then disappears underneath the posterior belly of the digastric, giving off a suprahyoid branch there, and running forward deep to the hyoglossus to reach the tip of the tongue. Coming off here is the facial artery, just below the lower border of the posterior bed of digastric, passes under the digastric, runs over the posterior part of the submandibular salivary gland, and so comes round onto the face. And it is at this point that it is lying just in front of the anterior border of the masseter, and it is here that the anaesthetist can take the pulse of a patient when the rest of the body is covered. So here is the facial artery, the loop of it. Now coming off the posterior border of the external carotid, in the same sort of region, is the occipital artery. And the occipital artery there crosses the uh, internal carotid, passes up deep to the stenomastoid, and so we see it here coming up round into the occipital region. And above here we have the posterior auricular artery, another branch, of the external carotid running along the upper border of the posterior bed of the digastric. Advanced techniques in diagnostic x-ray now make it possible selectively to inject radio-opaque medium into any major vessel in the body. This is an injection of the common carotid artery. By a special technique, the bone and soft tissue parts may be subtracted, leaving the vessels in black and readily visible. This subtraction view shows the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. We shall look at some of the branches of the external carotid artery. The superior thyroid artery is disappearing below the film margin. The thin ascending pharyngeal artery crosses behind the internal carotid and courses upward to supply the pharynx and palate. the lingual artery, the external maxillary or facial artery, the occipital artery. Prior to plunging into the parotid substance, the external carotid gives off a small posterior auricular artery. Within the parotid, the external carotid divides into a larger internal maxillary artery seen coursing into the deep structures of the face. The smaller terminal branch is the superficial temporal artery to the scalp. Note the middle meningeal branch of the maxillary artery. This is a subtraction x-ray study of the common carotid artery showing the external and the internal branches at the bifurcation. In this film, the first external carotid branch, the superior thyroid artery, is well shown as it takes its descending course to the superior pole of the gland. A branch, the superior laryngeal, visible on the anterior side, supplies blood to the muscles, mucous membranes, and glands of the larynx. The occipital artery is shown well and the lingual artery is visible passing beneath the mandible 
to the tongue and the floor of the mouth. The external maxillary artery to the pharyngeal area and face is remarkably tortuous. This is to allow accommodation to pharyngeal movement on deglutition and movements of the mandible and face. Continuation of the external carotid artery into the parotid substance and its terminal branches. Arteriosclerotic disease of the internal carotid artery is readily demonstrated in this case. The narrowing to near occlusion of the internal carotid is the likely basis for symptoms of cerebral ischemia in this patient. I think we should put in straight away the vagus nerve. Now you remember the vagus nerve comes down the neck having emerged from the uh, skull through the jugular foramen and it comes down and is lying in the posterior part of the carotid sheath uh, with the internal carotid artery and with the internal jugular vein and so we see it coming down here accompanying the common carotid and internal carotid arteries. Now way up, high up here beneath the digastric it has given off its superior laryngeal nerve. And the superior laryngeal nerve we shall see coming down here. It's quite a sizable nerve lying on the side of the pharynx. And it is in this region that it gives off the internal laryngeal nerve, which pierces the posterior part of the thyroid membrane. It's a sensory nerve and supplies the mucous membrane around the entrance into the larynx and supplies the mucous membrane of the larynx down as far as the vocal cords inside. A much finer terminal branch runs down in company with the superior thyroid artery and eventually supplies the cricothyroid muscle. So that we see that the external uh, laryngeal nerve is a slender nerve running down here to supply the cricothyroid. This muscle tenses the vocal cords and we can sort of summarize the nerve supply to the muscles of the larynx by saying that they're all supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except the cricothyroid, which is supplied by the external laryngeal branch of 10. We might just indicate here the position of the recurrent laryngeal nerve coming up between the trachea and the esophagus and going deep there uh, to the lower border of the uh, inferior constrictor. It is uh, easy to see how this nerve could be damaged in operations on the thyroid when the uh, superior thyroid artery is tied. The external laryngeal nerve lies on the surface of the inferior constrictor and ends by giving innervation to the cricothyroid muscle. The thyrohyoid strap muscle overlies all but the central part of the thyroid cartilages, or Adam's apple, politely referred to as the laryngeal prominence. Now the thyroid gland is placed around the trachea just below the larynx and in front of the carotid artery, the superior thyroid artery. Deep to it is the superior laryngeal nerve, giving the external branch an internal branch, which gives sensibility to the laryngeal mucous membrane. Reflection of the thyroid gland medially demonstrates the inferior thyroid artery. The esophagus. the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which innervates all of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroidus. Well, now we're in a position to put in uh, the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve emerges from the carotid sheath by winding around the lower border of the posterior bilodigastric and the occipital artery, just as the occipital artery there is giving off its sternomastoid branch. And then the hypoglossal nerve winds forwards across the external carotid artery and then it's going to cross the loop of the lingual artery and then pass up deep to the posterior belly of the digastric there onto the hyoglossus and then disappears behind the mylohyoid. And this nerve is going to supply all the muscles of the tongue.
Now it's quite interesting that running down in the hypoglossal nerve is a small branch of the anterior primary ramus of C1. And this branch uh, uh, leaves the hypoglossal nerve as, in fact, two small fibers. One coming down here on the external carotid, which we shall follow in a moment, and a branch here which comes off to supply uh, the thyrohyoid. So, although these are branches of the hypoglossal nerve, they are, in fact, C1 fibers. And we shall follow this uh, small branch down in a moment. The submaxillary triangle is occupied superficially by the submandibular gland. Over it, one may see a prominent lymph node where the facial vessels cross. By reflecting the gland from its bed, the inferior borders of the triangle formed by the posterior belly of the digastric and the anterior belly of the digastric may be seen. Crossing the triangle beneath the submaxillary gland is the hypoglossal nerve. It passes forward deep to the mylohyoid muscle to innervate the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Adjacent to it is the submandibular duct, or Wharton's duct. Here is the hypoglossal nerve after removal of the contents of the submaxillary triangle in the neck dissection. Electrical stimulation and a response in the elevator strap muscle and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Stimulation where the nerve passes deep to the mylohyoid causes contraction of the muscles in the tongue, seen as the tongue is held protruding from the mouth. This patient had a calculus or stone in the submandibular duct. An attempt to remove this stone by intraoral surgery resulted in injury to the hypoglossal nerve. With the intrinsic tongue muscles paralyzed, there is notable atrophy of the tongue on the side of injury, and it protrudes, pointing toward the side of paralysis. The patient had no sense of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the right side of the tongue because the closely related lingual nerve was also damaged. Inability to control the tongue early after paralysis resulted in frequent self-inflicted bite wounds and subsequent scars. Surgery was later performed through a submandibular external incision to remove the badly diseased submandibular gland and calculus and to repair the injured lingual and hypoglossal nerve. The superior laryngeal nerve is preserved in neck dissection. To show its function in this case, a balloon was placed on the tracheal anesthesia tube in the larynx and pressure measurements of the vocal cords against the balloon were recorded. With electrical stimulation, the superior laryngeal nerve, there was an immediate squeeze on the laryngeal balloon. This demonstrates contraction of the cricothyroidus muscle, which tightens the vocal cords. The recording, farthest to the right, shows a sudden increase in pressure and release as stimulation of the nerve ceases. If the vagus nerve is stimulated, the other intrinsic muscles of the larynx contract, and this also is recorded as increased pressure on the laryngeal balloon. Injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve results in paralysis of one vocal cord and marked hoarseness. So also does injury of the vagus nerve, which gives rise to the recurrent laryngeal. Here again, on the record on the right, is seen the squeeze on the intralaryngeal balloon. Now, in the posterior triangle, we found this important nerve here, the spinal accessory. And we found it emerging from the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and it 
in fact comes around here through this sternocleidomastoid uh, by leaving the clotted sheath at that point. And so it goes on down here. So it's important that this nerve should be identified in doing a block dissection of the neck, the spinal accessory entering the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoids. So then, in relation to this arterial trunk, common carotid, external internal carotid, we have the vagus nerve lying towards the back, we have the hypoglossal nerve sweeping across and crossing the lingual artery, and we have going into the sternocleidomastoid the spinal accessory. Well, now we are in a position to put the large vein here uh, coming up, or it's rather going down in the neck, uh, the internal jugular vein. And if we just put it in position here, lying in the carotid sheath, and indicate it here, and we can enlarge it as we go down, if necessary, here it comes down, and lying in this position here, we can rub out now the structures that lie medial to it, the vagus lying between the common carotid and the internal jugular, and between the internal carotid and the internal jugular. So we'll run out the structures that lie in relation to it, medial to it, so here's the internal jugular vein, and it's receiving its tributaries, uh, it's formed in the uh, here, by, drain, by coming through the internal, uh, by the coming through the jugular foramen, by being continuous with the sigmoid sinus, and then as it's coming down in this region, I won't put it in. It drains the pharyngeal venous plexus, and then it receives here the common facial vein, and then it receives the uh, lingual vein, and then it receives the superior thyroid vein, and then it receives the uh, middle thyroid vein, and so on. Having put in the internal jugular vein, we're now in a position to bring down the C1 fibers of the descendant's hypoglossal. You may remember we said that these C1 fibers run in the hypoglossal nerve and are distributed uh, to the thyrohyde muscle and also come down here uh, as the descendant's hypoglossal. Now, when it reaches the lower third of the neck, we see that there's another nerve passing down here from the anterior primary rami of C2 and 3. It's quite a small nerve and is known as the descendant cervicalis. And the two unite, that is the descendant hypoglossi, unites with the descendant cervicalis to form the anter hypoglossi. And it is from this loop that we shall see the strap muscles in front of the neck are going to be innervated. Innervated from C1 and C2 and 3. Well, here we have then the posterior belly of the omohyoid. So let's carry this forward across this region and join it up with the anterior belly. So here's the posterior belly and then we put in an intermediate tendon here and then we bring down the anterior belly from the lower margin of the body of the hyoid like this, crossing the side of the larynx and now if we rub out the structures that lie deep to this we can see how this literally straps down the structures in the neck. So here then is the anterior belly of the amyloid, the intermediate tendon, the posterior belly of the amyloid. And now we can attach a sling from the deeper surface of the clavicle coming up over the intermediate tendon and back again to the clavicle. And so we can just indicate this is lying in this situation here, binding down this intermediate tendon. So that when this muscle contracts, instead of having a pull in this direction, it's converted into an oblique downward pull and so helps in the descent of the larynx uh, during the process of uh, uh, swallowing. Well, now we should superimpose on the side of the internal jugular vein on the lateral surface uh, the deep cervical lymph nodes. These nodes are embedded in the carotid sheath and are very closely associated with the trinitary and ventricular of the internal jugular vein. So closely associated that it's almost impossible to separate these nodes from the internal jugular vein. So we can just indicate their presence 
here coming down hard up against the internal jugular vein. Well now to complete this front part of the neck we must bring up the strap muscles uh, the sternohyoid and the sternothyroid and the sternothyroid sternohyoid rather comes up here in this sort of plane from the back of the manubrium sterni and the sternothyroid comes up in, from the same area behind the manubrium sterni and comes into an old to the chalk so you can see its color comes into the oblique line on the lateral lamina of the thyroid cartilage like that and it's coming round in front here the two uh, cross one another in that region superficial to the thyroid gland we shall replace the strap muscles the sternothyroid and the sternohyoid the sternohyoid the sternothyroid and the omohyoid and so we can see uh, that we have built up the greater part of the anterior triangle so let us now put in the sternocleidomastoid first of all outlining it in white and then rubbing out the structures that lie deep to it the internal jugular vein the descendant hypoglossi and the descendant cervicalis uh, and uh, the deep cervical lymph nodes Now we bring down the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. And now we can see that the anterior triangle of the neck it can be subdivided into a series of small triangles. The carotid triangle bounded behind by the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid above by the posterior bed of the digastric and in front by the anterior bed of the amohyoid. It's called the carotid triangle but it has three parts of the carotid, the uh, internal, the external and a small part of the common carotid. Up here we have the digastric triangle with the anterior bed of the, bed of the digastric, the posterior bed of the digastric and the lower margin of the body of the mandible and lying in that triangle will be the submandibular salivary gland, the superficial part of it. In front, where we have the two diverging anterior bed of the digastric, we have the submental triangle. And lastly, down here, we have the muscular triangle formed by the anterior bed of the amohyoid, the anterior border of the sternum mastoid, and the midline of the neck. Now, for sake of completion, we mustn't forget that the whole of this area of the neck, both the anterior and the posterior triangle, is ensheathed in the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. And this, when it reaches the, an the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, splits to enclose it, and then takes off from the front and passes round to the other side. And coming down superficial to that is an important vein rising, arising in the region of the body of the hyoid bone here and passing down and an anterior jugular vein passes down and pierces the deep fascia just above the sternum and then passes back behind the sternocleidomastoid and joins the external jugular vein which we saw uh, coming down across here in this way. Let us replace the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the cadaver 
and over it we shall redrape the platysma. Now one may see the relationships of the external jugular vein. Now coming down on the inner surface of the mandible from the medial pterygoid plate is the pterygomandibular ligament. And I'm just going to indicate its position through a sort of transparent uh, ramus of the mandible. And we can show coming off the front of this pterygomandibular ligament the buccinator muscle. Now the buccinator comes forward from the ligament and the fibers extend forward in this way and also from the margin, the alveolar margin of the mandible until we get to the region of the mouth and I'll just indicate the position of the lateral angle of the mouth here and we can see how the fibers are coming into the mouth and becoming part into digitating with the orbicularis oris muscle. So this is the buccinator muscle. Attached to the uh, lateral surface of the uh, uh, mandible, we have coming down from this area, from the zygomatic arch, we have the masseter muscle. And the masseter muscle comes down and is inserted into the outer surface of the ramus of the mandible and the junction of the ramus of the body in that fashion. And so we can now rub out the structures that lie deep to that. The ramus of the mandible and the buccinator muscle and put in the fibers of the masseter muscle or masseter muscle. Now when we think of the styloid process we should be thinking of the stylohyoid ligament which passes down here into the lesser cornea of the hyoid bone. And we should be thinking also of the muscles that arise from this uh, styloid process. We have the stylohyoid muscle, which passes down here and goes into the hyoid splitting to enclose the intermediate tendon of the digastric. The stylopharyngeus arises from the back part of the styloid process and passes down and will disappear between the superior and middle constrictor and we'll just leave it there for the moment. And then we can put in, in front here, arising from the front of the styloid process, the styloglossus muscle, which is coming down and disappearing behind the mandible and will pass down and sweep into the tongue. Now before we go any further, we must put in the superior constrictor. Now the superior constrictor is emerging from behind the ramus of the mandible, and I can just indicate its upper margin sweeping round like this to go into the raphe, which is in the midline posteriorly. So we'll just indicate the outer surface of the superior constrictor coming around in this way. The lower fibers arising from the lower part of the pterygomandibular ligament and then sweeping down in this way and sweeping around to meet the fellow of the opposite side. And then we can put in here the origin of the middle constrictor arising from the lower part of the stylohyoid ligament and the upper margin of the greater cornea of the hyoid bone and that sweeps up here like that overlapping the superior constrictor and the lower margin sweeping down that way. Now we can rub, rub out here the superior constrictor showing these fibers of the middle constrictor coming around fanning out as they do so. Coming out of the skull between the styloid process and the mastoid process, there's a small hole there, the stylomastoid foramen. Coming out of the skull in that situation is the facial nerve. And I'm just going to leave it there uh, coming forward. So we're now, we've now built up the bed for the parotid gland. And to fully appreciate this bed, I think we should pass over to that side of the board and uh, take a horizontal section through this area and put in all the muscles and structures that we've entered into this diagram. Now I'm just going to take a section here across the mastoid process. These are the mastoid air cells. 
And I'm going to indicate over here the posterior margin of the ramus of the mandible. So this is the mandible. I'm going to put in, here is the sternocleidomastoid, and I'm going to put in on this side the sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid, sternocleidomastoid. On the outer surface of the mandible, we have the masseter muscle. Masseter coming down from the zygomatic arch and being inserted into the outer surface of the mandible. Coming down from the zygomatic arch and being inserted into the outer surface of the mandible. Now we should consider a muscle that's lying on the medial surface of the mandible that we cannot see in this diagram. And this is the medial pterygoid muscle. It is coming down from the pterygoid region to be inserted into the medial, medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. So here is the medial pterygoid muscle. And for completion, we can just show here the inferior alveolar nerve going into that foramen there. Now, have we a muscle on the medial surface of the mastoid process? Yes, we have. It is the posterior belly of the digastric. And we'll put that in. The posterior belly of the digastric is attached to the inner surface of the mastoid process and is coming sweeping down here to its intermediate tendon. So we can rub out the structures that lie medial to it as the anterior border of the sternocleidal mastoid and here is the posterior bed of the digastric going down to its intermediate tendon. Now that's attached to the medial surface of the mastoid process. So we can put it over here to the medial surface of the mastoid process, the posterior belly of the digastric. Well now we're in a position to put in the styloid process. So we put in the styloid process across here at about this point. And we can indicate the muscles which are attached to it. We have here the styloglossus passing forwards, the styloglossus. We have here the stylohyoid muscle passing from near the tip, the stylohyoid muscle. We have here the stylopharyngeus muscle, the stylopharyngeus muscle. Now, what is lying medial to the styloid process in its muscle? Clearly, it is the superior constrictor. So we can indicate over on this diagram the superior constrictor coming round here in that way. So you see, we now have a triangular area here in which the parotid gland will lie, bounded in front by the, mas uh, by the uh, mandible and bounded behind uh, by the mastoid process and its associated muscles. Before we put any more in, let us bring up the uh, carotid vessels. We have the internal carotid artery coming up here, passing deep to the posterior bed of the digastric and passing up here in the carotid sheath. And we have passing up in front of it and medial to it the external carotid artery. And this will pass up here and it will pass to the neck of the mandible where it will divide into its terminal branches. The internal maxillary and the superficial temporal artery. So now we can put this in. We have here the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery is lying in this region and we'll show it bifurcating into the internal maxillary and the superficial temporal artery. Now we can bring up the internal uh, jugular vein and it's overlapping across the carotid, uh, internal carotid artery lying within the carotid sheath and so we can indicate this large vein disappearing under the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. And having passed up deep to the posterior bed of the digastric, we will of course overlap the whole of this structure here, the internal carotid, and pass up like this in this region. So we can put in here the internal jugular vein uh, cut across. Now whenever you think of the internal jugular vein, and the carotid arteries, 
you should be thinking in terms of the vagus nerve. So there we have the vagus nerve, and we take a section across this, in this region, so here we have then the carotid sheath enclosing these structures. All right, well now let us uh, draw in uh, the outline of the parotid gland, how it's going to sit in relation to these structures. It's going to pass into this uh, wedge-shaped depression between the mandible and the sternomastoid. So we will try to indicate the fact that it is passing in here, and as it comes out, it overlaps the surface of the sternocleidomastoid. And it is now coming out here. It encircles the carotid and comes out here and overlaps this region and comes down in this region. Now this is just the outline and the section through it. It is going in here. Now let us go over to the other diagram and we can see that it will come in here like this, will overlap, overlap forward, come round here and will actually pass in between the medial pterygoid and the mandible as the pterygoid process and then it will pass in like that. So that we're now in a position uh, to put in some of the important nerves that sweep round. Now for example, here comes the facial nerve, it sweeps around and it actually divides the parotid gland into a superficial part and a deep part. So here is the styloid process, here's the mastoid process, so this would be the reason of the stylomastoid foramen, so here's the facial nerve. And as it sweeps forwards, it divides into an upper and lower part. Now I'm going to indicate those as being side by side, as a bit of an artistic license, but at least it shows it's dividing into two main divisions. Now this divides the parotid into a superficial part and a deep part. And the facial nerve, having divided into these two branches, emerges on the anterior, an anterior border. And so we see the facial nerve going into an upper division and a lower division and emerging from the front. And here the terminal branches will be. The lower branch will come down into the neck, is the cervical branch, then we shall have a mandibular branch passing forward onto the mandible and a buccal branch passing forward over the mesita to the buccinator. And then the upper division will come up here is a temporal branch and a zygomatic branch. So we see that the facial nerve emerges on the anterior border of the parotid gland as a number of branches. Uh, the temporal, the zygomatic, the buccal, the mandibular and the cervical branch. And it is this cervical branch which is going down to supply the platysma muscle. It will be appreciated that these nerves are going to supply the muscles of facial expression. I want to draw your attention to a small branch uh, coming off this cervical branch known as the marginal uh, nerve. And this passes up over the lower margin of the mandible and will supply uh, a small but nevertheless important part of the musculature around the mouth called the depressor anguli oris. And should this be un uh, unavoidably cut uh, during a surgical operation, this will result in distortion of the mouth. So this is the marginal branch of the uh, cervical branch of the uh, facial nerve. In the superficial tissues of the neck, one may identify the marginal branch of the facial nerve over the submandibular salivary gland. When the skin flaps are being elevated during operation, the marginal branch of the facial nerve should be preserved. Electrical stimulation helps the surgeon to locate the nerve so it may be dissected free and protected. Note the contraction of the depressors of the angle of the mouth on electrical stimulation of the marginal branch. Acute injuries of the face, even when they are superficial, may injure specific branches of the facial nerve. This clean laceration across the margin of the mandible has divided the marginal branch of the facial nerve. The diagnosis should be made before any wound manipulation or injection of anesthetic agent is carried out. By asking the patient to smile or show his teeth, one will see 
elevation of the lower lip on the side of injury as evidence of paralysis of the depressors of the angle of the mouth. Now, while we're talking about the facial nerve, let's go across to this diagram and uh, put in some more branches of the facial nerve near its emergence from the stylomastoid foramen. Here, it gives off a nerve to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. And this nerve, the same nerve or uh, another nerve arising from the trunk, will pass forward and supply uh, the stylohyoid muscle. So then, the facial nerve gives off these uh, branches before it, it enters uh, the parotid gland. There's one more branch that passes up here and goes round the back of the ear to supply the auricularis posterior and superior muscles which move the oracle of the ear. Now let us consider the other muscles around the styloid process. We have the stylopharyngeus and this is supplied by the ninth cranial nerve which is still lying inside the carotid sheath. We have the stylobrosis muscle here, which is supplied by the 12th cranial nerve, but this receives its nerve supply lower down. We have here the sternocleidomastoid, which is supplied by the 11th cranial nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, which as we've seen previously, crosses and goes through the sternocleidomastoid and also supplies the trapezius. Now let us turn to uh, just a brief discussion of the capsules of this important salivary gland. The salivary gland itself has its own true capsule, which I have indicated in white. Around the outside of this, it has a fascial covering uh, derived from the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. And this encloses the uh, salivary gland uh, in a tough outer covering, uh, which in cases of parotitis uh, is responsible for the tension inside the parotid gland. Uh, incidentally, this part here is particularly thickened to form the stylomandibular ligament, which goes from the back of the stylo process, uh, front of the stylo process rather, back down to the mandible. Uh, lying between uh, the true and the false capsule here, we have some little lymph nodes here, the superficial uh, parotid lymph nodes. So that now we're in a position to put in the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and to remind you that supplying the skin over this region, we have the great auricular nerve. The great auricular nerve arriving from the anterior primary rami of C2 and 3 is passed around in this region over onto the angle of the jaw. The reason I'm drawing your attention to this is that if a child or anybody else gets a, a penetrating uh, injury, such as a dart, going into the parotid gland from the side, you can see how it's possible to damage the great auricular nerve, which is the sensory nerve here, supplying the skin and the sweat gland, and come right the way through, and also damage the secretor motor fibers coming up from the auricular temporal nerve. And during the process of repair, these two uh, sets of fibers may cross, so that some of the secretor motor fibers may come out into the great auricular nerve and cause sweating every time the person uh, thinks about uh, food. An interesting anatomical complication described previously by Dr. Snell called gustatory sweating. On gustatory stimulation, sweating appears in a localized area over the area of elevation of skin flaps for the parotidectomy. This is a result of regrowth of fibers from the auriculotemporal nerve which normally n stimulate parotid secretion out to the skin flap and to the transected nerves to the sweat glands over this localized area of skin flap elevation. Note the localized production of sweat over the parotid gland area on gustatory stimulation. This is Fry's syndrome, or gustatory sweating. Now let us complete the rest of this uh, gland. We bring it up and we see that it is snugly uh, passes down behind 
at the, in front rather below here, the external atriatus, and comes up here into the region of the glenoid cavity. And a part of it actually tucks into that glenoid cavity behind the joint, and it is this glenoid process of the parotid gland which, when inflamed in months, causes difficulty in uh, opening the joint. It becomes painful. The gland then sweeps forward across the outer surface of the head of the mandible and overlaps the mosquito muscle and then comes down and so we have the complete part of the gland. Now it's possible to rub out the structures that lie within the parotid, emphasizing again the importance of that facial nerve lying quite superficial to the uh, deep structures inside the gland. And so we see that it is a triangular shaped structure imprisoned between the anterior border of the stenocladomastoid the posterior margin of the mandible and going up to the external ear coming across and then usually extending over and this part sometimes called the facial process of the parotid gland. Now all that remains to uh, be put into this drawing uh, is the duct of the gland. Now to get the surface marking of the duct one has to draw a line forward from the lower part of the lobe of the ear to the midpoint between the alar of the nose and the upper red margin of the upper lip, a line drawn from those two points. Now we take the middle third of that line. So just to estimate, if here is the external ultimatus, the lower part of the lobe is somewhere there, between the alar of the nose and the, and the upper red margin of the upper lip will be a point about here, and we draw a line forward from there. And we see the duct comes forward over the outer surface, lateral surface of the mosquito, pierces the buccal pad of fat, which is a buccal, little fat here clumped lying on the lateral surface of the buccinator, and then turns around and passes through, passes medially through the buccinator and goes through the cheek. Now it doesn't immediately pierce the mucous membrane, but passes forward a little way before it enters the mouth opposite the upper second molar. In other words, there's a sort of valvular uh, orifice there, so every time you blow or blow a trumpet, you don't blow up your parotid gland. It's a valvular mechanism. Now just to go over some of the lobes of the gland, we have here the, the facial process and there may be an accessory part of the gland up here with little ducts coming into the main gland. So here's the facial process, an accessory part of the gland, the glenoid process that goes into the glenoid cavity, and here we have the pterygoid process passing uh, medial to the ramus of the mandible. The surface projection of the parotid duct or Stenson's duct, a line between the nasal ala and the earlobe. It enters the mouth where a vertical line from the lateral canthus of the eye intersects this line. We may see the relationship of the parotid duct as the orifice of the duct adjacent to the second upper molar tooth is probed. The parotid gland is reflected anteriorly to show the cervical and mandibular branches of the facial nerve. The main trunk of the facial nerve with its upper and lower division. With the gland reflected downward, one may see the terminal branches of the facial nerve as well as its main trunk. From the upper division, the temporal branches, the zygomatic branches, and from the lower division, the buccal branches and the mandibular branches, as well as the cervical. Note the relationship of the parotid duct. In the neck dissection and superficial parotidectomy, the facial nerve branches are carefully preserved. 
This is the cut parotid duct. Blue dye has been injected into the parotid duct preoperatively, and it makes the nerve stand out against the deeply stained parotid substance. The zygomatic and buccal branches, the cervical branches to the platysma which have been cut. Now with electrical stimulation of the main trunk, all of the facial muscles respond. Stimulation of separate branches and response of specific muscle groups. The zygomatic, the buccal, the mandibular, and the marginal mandibular. Buccal, zygomatic, and temporal. The temporal bone, with its zygomatic process and mastoid process. The mastoid process has been drilled out to show the relationships of the external auditory meatus. Here is the external auditory meatus. and its relationship to the inner ear and the semicircular canals. The facial nerve passes adjacent to this area and emerges from the stylomastoid foramen between the styloid process and the mastoid process. In the next section, let's review the fact that all of the branches of the facial nerve are intact. The marginal branch, the buccal branches, the buccal and zygomatic branches, and the temporal branches. After check on the facial nerve and a careful review for hemostasis, and for security of ties on the internal jugular vein, we shall replace the skin flaps in our patient who has undergone block resection of the neck contents, the superficial lobe of the parotid gland, and the entire side of the face where the malignant melanoma had resided. Here is the patient postoperatively. The lack of full trapezius function has been well compensated for. The patient's facial nerve is fully intact and functional. One may palpate and see the carotid pulsation. Here is the second patient. Note that he also has compensated quite nicely for lack of function of the accessory nerve. He is able to cover the skin grafted area where his large melanoma resided with his own normal hair growth. The skin wounds have healed kindly, and it is possible to see the pulsations of the carotid. The patient has full facial nerve function, and there is no evidence of loss in function of the hypoglossal nerve. 
Note that tongue function is quite normal. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.